Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Osan Mumba, streaming in from Nairobi from the United Nations Environment Programme, and I'm going to be your moderator for this session. This is absolutely exciting to be part of this Race to Zero and session, which is all part of a series convened by the high-level champions for the global climate action all of this week and part of next week. It's all very important and really pivotal at this moment of our human history. I'm so excited to say that we have well over 500 people registered for this event. Thank you so much for making time on this Tuesday for joining us and being part of this really important discussions. Just a little bit of housekeeping, which is so critical and important. We'll be the stream, we'll be live tweeting from wherever, all over the world. So you have two hashtags and the hashtags, hashtag adaptation without borders and also hashtag race to zero. Now, you also have a chance to submit your comments and questions throughout the event, which we're going to take into account and also directed at specific speakers that we're going to have on different panels. And then we're going to find time for a Q&A where we're going to be responding to these questions from you. I'm really, really looking forward to this. And I also want to say that this is a recorded session. And right after this event, we're going to make sure that we consolidate everything and the recording will be, will be ready for those who may not be able to join us. Now, perhaps I should begin by saying this session is very important because it's going to be focusing on building a climate resilient and just future for all, managing the cascading climate risk in a global, global supply chains. Now, if you, I mean, everybody in the world was shocked when this pandemic happened, but we were very ill prepared for what followed right after the lockdowns, borders shut down. The very things that we're dependent on on a daily basis that would come through either shipping or cargo or anything uh, for that matter, just did not show up. And so what is, how do we then prepare ourselves in these very deep changes that are affecting our planet? Well, we've only just had a pandemic. Now let's just imagine the climate change risk that actually could go with our global supply chains. So today we just have such a fantastic lineup of speakers and I'm really, really looking forward to listening and just really learning from all of these amazing speakers. And I want to also add that this has been convened by Mr. Nigel Topping, who is also one of the UNFCCC, um, the, UN, the, the high level champion of the UNFCCC together with Mr. Munoz as well. We do have Mr. Nigel Topping. Unfortunately, he could not join us live on, on this session, but he will be joining us on a call. And if we can have Mr. I'm Nigel here, Topping Ms. to I'm read. Here. Oh, fantastic. This is such great news. We're so glad that you're here and you made it. So we look forward to really having you now join in um, and just give us three, four minutes remarks on, you know, how this cascading climate risk building resilient global supply chains and the importance of strengthening action on adaptation and resilience around the world. Well, thank you, Ms. Onda. Um, first of all, apologies for um, failing the tech test this morning, but I'm, um, I'm glad I found a, a way to join you. And I'm really thrilled to join you because this is such an important issue um, and one that, I mean, I know I'm in really in learning mode personally. I've spent most of my career either in industry or I'm working really focused on mitigation. And this, this issue, as you say, Ms. Sonda, really highlighted by um, the pandemic of how the, the kind of fragility and the interconnectedness of our global system can lead to these cross-border effects that can um, really cascade throughout um, global value chains. And you know, I'm really delighted that, that, that this to be putting so much emphasis on resilience as part of these series of um, dialogues uh, around the race to zero and as part of um, helping me and Gonzalo and our team um, try work to formulate a, a, a campaign for more action on resilience if you'd like to, to, to be the sister campaign to the, the race to zero um, with a focus on mitigation and, and on this particular dialogue as you say I don't think it could be more timely um, you know, we all rely on global supply chains and they are going to be critical in our efforts to create a sustainable and inclusive and resilient economy. Um, and, and I think as you suggest this, this, we could see the pandemic as a canary in the coal mine undermining just how important it's going to be that we don't just decarbonize our value chains, but that we build resilience 
into them. I mean, we we talk about um, systemic change, and this this really is a systemic issue. Um, so um, we need to ensure that approaches to strengthen resilience of global supply chains don't just increase protection for some at the expense of others. They need not to be re about the redistribution of risk. They need to be the, about the overall reduction of risk, so that we do make the transition, the just transition to a more resilient world. And, and that's why I think this kind of multi-stakeholder approach, this multi-stakeholder dialogue that you're hosting um, is so important because we need to listen to each other and remember that our point of view is not the only one. There are other valid points of view. Um, and I think that w when we listen respectfully to each other, we can collectively come up with much more robust um, solutions. So um, thank you um, to, to SEI also, of course, to Adaptation Without Borders and the Climate Resilience Network and the IEA for coming together and, and thank you Misando for inviting me to join you. I'm going to go back now see if I can figure out the, the camera in the background but I, I, I'm listening and I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning a lot and thank you so much everybody. Thank you so very much for those really critical and important intervention and really highlighting the importance of systems change and I think if there's an opportunity right now as you've rightly said our fragility, our interconnectedness and how we need to rethink the very existence as we existing right now, really a need for change and the robustness of solutions. Thank you so very much for that. Now, our next speaker, and I'm delighted to introduce him, is Mr. Michiro Oe, who is the Director of International Strategy Division in the Ministry of Environment of Japan. And he's been working on international coordination and cooperation related to climate change and other global environmental issues from 2011 through to 2015, and he was engaged in the negotiations for the adoption of the Paris Agreement. He will be providing the keynote for this event. Over to you, Mr. Michiro. Uh, thank you, Musonda, for your kind introduction. And it is my great honor to be here to make a keynote presentation. I'm going to about the online platform for Redesign 2020, which is the initiative of Japan regarding climate and environmental actions in the context of recovery from COVID-19. So uh, could you uh, next slide, please? OK. Uh, we are now facing two crises, coronavirus pandemic and the climate change. The COP26 of UNF UNFCCC were, was postponed to November next year due to the coronavirus pandemic. However, we should not lose our will and the momentum of enhancing climate actions towards COP26. In the recovery from COVID-19, we should aim at building back better towards more sustainable and resilient society. In other words, we should uh, utilize the recovery from corona pandemic as an opportunity to redesign our socioeconomy. That is the idea behind when my minister, Japanese minister, environment minister Koizumi proposed this initiative in late April, when uh, just uh, after post postponement of COP26 was announced. This initiative had two objectives. Firstly, to share information and exchange views among countries and among various stakeholders on climate and environmental policies and actions in the recovery of, uh, COVID, from COVID-19. The second objective is to keep international momentum through this kind of sharing information and exchange of views on climate actions. And the initiative consists of two components. One is the online ministerial meeting, which was held on 3rd of September this year. This event was hosted and chaired by Minister Koizumi himself, with getting a full support by UNF, UNFCCC Secretariat. All parties of the convention were invited to join this event, physically or pre-recorded video messages. And 46 ministers and vice ministers participated in the meeting, actually. And uh, nearly 100 countries in total joined uh, this event by providing messages and information on related policies and measures. And the second important part of this initiative is to develop the web-based information hub called Platform for Redesign 2020. This platform 
launched at the ministerial online meeting uh, contains messages and uh, detailed information on policies and measures submitted by uh, participating countries. Okay, next slide, please. Here are uh, overall pictures of information contained in the platform website. I'm sorry for the very small letters in this uh, slide, uh, but uh, if you look at the, uh, the pie chart in the left, uh, uh, many actions and categories uh, include climate mitigation in green, about uh, 400, uh, more than 400 activities in the um, climate mitigations, as well as uh, activities on adaptations and other environmental measures, uh, as you can see here. So in total, we have more than a thousand of actions or policies uh, provided by uh, some 70 countries. And many actions are taken in various areas, such as uh, sustainable transportation and uh, transition to renewable energies, followed by waste management, adaptation planning, and so on. As you can see in the uh, chart uh, in, the, in the bottom subcategory graph. And these measures are planned or undertaken in various time scale, which is shown in the pie chart on the right. We categorize them in three types. Firstly, uh, the response, which is a short-term action to cope with the pandemic, such as a proper management of infectious waste. The second is recovery, recovery measures, which are undertaken in the medium scale, time scale, say one to a few uh, years, aiming at economic recovery in a sustainable manner. And the last three, the third three, the redesign policies with uh, aims at socioeconomic change in the longer term. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, here are some examples of major measures. Many countries, such as EU and several European countries, embed uh, environmental policy packages in its budget plan, which aims to ensure sustainable, inclusive, and fair recovery. Many countries strengthen deployment of renewable energy, such as solar power and wind power. And some countries also promote R&D of hydrogen in their economic recovery packages. Greening and sustainable transportation is another area that many countries think important. For example, sustainable individual mobility, such as bicycles and scooters are promoted in order to achieve social distance, emission reduction, and the air pollution mitigation simultaneously. In Japan, we support the deployment of electric vehicles and bikes in home delivery and logistics services, whose demands have increased drastically due to the corona pandemic. Housing and urban planning is also important sector because the way of life and working has changed due to the pandemic. Several countries, including uh, Japan, aims at promoting digitalization to adapt the post corona world. And it is crucial to achieve both digitalization and emission reductions by enhancing energy efficiencies and greening uh, electricity. Throughout these actions, most countries also aim at increasing green jobs, which will support recovery of economy and employment. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, as a next steps of the, this initiative, we will take several activities. The first, we continue to update and maintain the platform based on information received from countries and other stakeholders, so that we will strengthen the role of the, this uh, platform as an information hub. Secondly, uh, also uh, we will uh, conduct analysis of policies and actions in various countries. This analytical work is done uh, getting a contribution by IGES, Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, and WRI, World Resource Institute. So we will examine uh, similarities and differences of plans of various countries, and we will identify the good practices and challenges 
or lessons learned from the, uh, each country's uh, actions and the policies. And we will demonstrate cases with synergies among various objectives, uh, such as decarbonization, circular economy, or resilient, uh, climate resilient societies. So we will, uh, based on this, this kind of analysis, we will develop a policy brief to further accelerate actions to redesign uh, resilient and sustainable society. And we would like to feedback uh, this uh, analysis and uh, policy brief to countries and organizations in uh, making use of various occasions, such as the side events at the uh, bodies and the COP26. Okay, and I think this is uh, the end of my slides, and I'd like to conclude uh, my presentations by providing some comments on the main theme of this event. First, it is no doubt that we are facing two risks of climate change and coronavirus, and it is important to consider the two crises altogether. The coronavirus pandemic may make our challenge to adopt climate risks more difficult and complicated. For example, to adopt climate, uh, climate related disasters is difficult, of course, and it will get more difficult if we are uh, asked to consider to cope with the risks of infectious diseases at the same time. Uh, from the viewpoint of climate mitigations, uh, as I have presented, many mitigation actions are undertaken in the context of recovery from the pandemic. Secondly, we, all, we are uh, facing these challenges and we all countries that face these challenges and no government is immune to the effects of risks of climate change. In this sense, international cooperation is the key to cope with the increasing risks. Not only cooperation among governments, collaborative work among various sectors and actors, such as uh, cooperation between national governments, local governments, and business, academia, and NGOs are important. Lastly, uh, based on uh, such recognitions, I believe that the platform for redesign in 2020 has a potential to contribute to cooperation among countries and cross sectors by providing uh, to learn experiences each other. I hope that this initiative of Japan contributes to addressing our common challenge uh, through managing the platform and conducting analytical work in the coming month. I stop here and th thank you very much for your risk kind listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Oi. Thank you very much really to the leadership of Minister Koizumi in making sure that Redesign 2020 happened, a fantastic platform and really ambitious to show the very need and importance of such a, a platform to really show that COVID-19 recovery plans need to be sustainable and also resilient, talking about, you know, decarbonization, circular economy, why should we live differently and also in the light of these global supply chains. Thank you very much. We're now going to be delving into a really fantastic panel discussions. And for those of you joining us now, thank you so very much for joining in. And I just want to say we have a fantastic panel discussion that's just about to start. And to begin this panel discussion, I'm just going to call upon Kevin Adams, who's a research fellow at Stockholm Environment Institute. And Kevin has been doing incredible research with different colleagues and counterparts. And we just want to know latest research, what is the latest research telling us about cascading and cross border nature of climate risk and its implications for the resilience of the global supply chains? Kevin, you have some minutes to just share these thoughts with us. Great. Uh, thanks so much for the very kind introduction, Masanda, and I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Um, as Masanda said, my name is Kevin Adams and I am a research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, as well as the London School of Economics. Um, so really happy to be here discussing some of the kind of new insights that are emerging in this space. Um, as Nigel said in the outset, this is a really a learning area for a lot of people because th this is sort of a, a new. So to start off, I'm, I'm going to lead here with a bit of an obvious statement. Um, in a globalizing world, our countries, communities and economies are interconnected. Um, and, and for many of us in this room, I suspect that that seems like an obvious thing to say. Um, but, but for those of us that have worked with adaptation and resilience for a long time, um, it's important to, to lead off with this because we've historically viewed adaptation 
risk management and resilience as an issue to only be focused on at the national, subnational, or local level. So, so to make sure that we're bringing the global interconnected nature of this phenomenon into the discussion is, is really a central component of our work here. Um, to set the scene a little bit, if you go to the next slide, Ian, um, this is a, a picture of a, a rice paddy in, in uh, Vietnam. Um, some of you might remember in about 2008, 2009, um, there were a series of co concurrent events that, that occurred right around the same time. Um, there were a number of major droughts across Asia. There were floods in other places. Um, and in general, what we saw was that the production of rice dropped through the floor, uh, unfortunately, across much of Southeast Asia. And, and while this is certainly a problem for those Southeast Asian communities, it wasn't only a problem for those countries. Um, right after we noticed that the harvests were going to be quite a bit lower that year than we expected, a number of countries responded by implementing various policy measures to increase their own resilience to the coming rice shocks and the changes to the price uh, in the market. Um, this included things like export bans, this included things like panic buying on the international market, um, and, and the cost of this was that the price of rice shot through the roof and countries like Senegal, many thousands of miles away, uh, were unable to afford the rice that they needed to sustain their, their food security. So in a way, there was a series of concurrent climate events that when followed by a number of policy moves that we one could consider would be helpful and useful to build the resilience nationally had adverse effects on another country many, many miles away. Um, so in terms of the research, how do we begin to, to think about these issues in a more systematic way? How do we begin to identify places where this may or may not occur or could be a problem? Um, so one of the things that I've been working on at SEI lately that, that I'm excited to, to give you all a teaser of today um, is an international index that is focused specifically on identifying transboundary climate risks in agricultural trade. Um, so what we have here is a graphic that we've developed for the rice market specifically, which is combining not only trade information, but climate signals and information about import dependency. So we can see here the top 10 high risk bilateral trade relationships in the rice market. And to take one example, uh, we see at the top of the list, rank number one is Thailand and Singapore. Um, so this is, is identifying for us that there's a potentially adverse trade relationship between Thailand and Singapore, both due to the amount of rice that Thailand is producing, Thailand's specific exposure to climate change, and how import dependent Singapore specifically is on Thai rice. So the, the key message of a slide like this is, is to really to underscore the fact that the resilience of, of uh, Singapore and its food security is fundamentally interconnected to what's going on in Thailand. And this is likely to be a discussion that needs to be had between those countries and can't necessarily be done independently. Uh, if we go to the next slide, Ian, um, it's also important to note that the bilateral relationships are not the only critical ones that we need to be looking at. When we aggregate this on a global level, we're allowed to see which major exporters tend to be disproportionately contributing risk to the international system. So in this case, we see that Vietnam, uh, Thailand and Indonesia, and Vietnam in particular, are overwhelmingly responsible for the, the amount of risk that is entering into the rice market. And, and I don't say responsible in the sense that this is mm -hmm. intentional, or expected or, or done in any sort of um, purposeful way on the part of the Vietnamese, but because the Vietnamese are such a key player in the international rice market, it is perhaps a benefit to the global rice trade system to be investing in the resilience of Vietnam, of Thailand, and of Indonesia. So this really helps change the calculus of the way that we're thinking about international trade, about the way that we're thinking about resilience and where it makes sense to invest our funds for adaptation, for risk, uh, for risk management, and, and trying to build um, better risk management relationships around the world. This can be seen as a potentially cooperative effort rather than an independent one. I've got a couple of country profiles up next that I think would be interesting to show you. Um, we can go ahead and skip past these Sankey diagrams, Ian, which I think are interesting, but show much of the same information. So in this case, we see something like um, which are profiles and focused on heavy bilateral relationships, some are more diffuse. But the country profiles, I think, are, are really interesting in particular. Um, so these are a couple of key exporters, um, Brazil and Vietnam, and we sort of see the same relationships that we saw in the, the major bilateral graphics. So Brazil, for example, has a particularly adverse trade relationship with Bolivia in a number of cases, both across the sugarcane and maize markets. 
suspecting that there might be reasons for international cooperation in that context. Um, Vietnam has a very specific coffee relationship with the Robusta trade, uh, coffee trade in, in Thailand, um, but a diffuse risk profile for, for rice. Um, this is interesting to contrast with major exporters like the US and China, who have, uh, on the next slide, very, very big spikes for a vast number of countries. So in the maize market in particular, the US and China are both very active. Wheat, the US is, a, is an essential player and, and rice in the Chinese context. So this also raises questions about how these major agricultural producers are likely to behave or become more important as we begin to recognize the, the transboundary nature of, of climate risk. Um, from the importer perspective, we can again see on, on the next slide that there are some countries that have very specific, highly import dependent relationships. This is on, on the right side, we've got Bolivia, where we can see the reverse of these relationships with Brazil and, and Kenya on the left, where there is some potential soy import problems um, with both the US and Brazil. Um, but for those of us who might think that this is purely an issue for developing countries who, who only have very specific adverse bilateral relationships, it's important to contrast this with places like the UK and Sweden. So even in this case, we see where import profiles are more diversified, the number of green spikes where trade is expected to even potentially benefit from climate change, places like Russia, Argentina, Canada, that might produce a bit more. This is dwarfed by the net amount of risk entering the system. So even if your risks are already diversified, as is the case in the UK and in Sweden, this doesn't necessarily mean that you are uh, entirely um, absolved from, from having to deal with this problem. So, so for those of us that might say, well, perhaps supply chain diversification is a way to manage this problem, these results initially suggest that that's not going to be a sufficient tool in, in this context. Um, can we go on to the next slide as well, Ian? Um, so, so the last couple of things I wanted to talk about is just to, to bring us home with some, some ideas about building structures to drive change and some key messages. So, so first of all, I think we obviously need a bit more research on this topic to understand how these risks are moving around the world um, and, and to get a better sense of how this is working in practice. So on the next slide, we've got a short uh, plug for a research project we're working on at SCI called Cascades, which is very focused on these specific issues, um, including international trade, stability and conflict, and finance and business, because this is not only an issue that's related to supply chains. Um, but on the next slide, we also see that research alone isn't necessarily going to be enough, uh, which is exactly the reason that we at SEI, along with our partners at ODI, IDRI, uh, and many others, including BSR and ISIMOD, uh, who are part of this call today, uh, have founded the Adaptation Without Borders initiative. Um, this initiative is not only built upon the key pillar of gathering evidence and more research, but about creating visibility around this issue, building connections and having conversations like these, and inspiring action by working with decision makers, with those folks working in supply chains to, to really push action forward. So to summarize, uh, a couple of key points to bring you all home. Uh, it's important to note that transboundary climate risks flow between all countries. This is regardless of power, regardless of wealth, regardless of our historical understandings of adaptation. This is something that everyone needs to be concerned with. Uh, next, there are significant differences between markets, which is important to note. The rice market is not the same as the wheat market, which is not the same as the coffee market. So we need to understand those risks differently and the policy proposals in those spaces might not be equivalent. Uh, there's also important geopolitical implications for climate risk in trade and production. Thinking about major exporters like China, like Brazil, like Russia, like the US, their behavior is likely to change notably as these risks become more prominent and, and uh, we have to consider that factor. I think there's one more. Uh, actors outside of climate policy might have important issues or important roles to play in key policy spaces. So thinking about, of course, trade has been a really key theme of our discussion today. Actors in supply chains are, are really essential. And I believe there's one last key message. Oh, nope, that's the last one. My mistake. Um, and that's all I have. So thanks so much for listening uh, and, and looking forward to hearing your questions uh, about this emerging space of work. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin, for that really insightful presentation, absolutely honing on some of the complexities of these um, products that we see on the market, sugar, maize, rice, wheat, coffee, soy. It's absolutely fantastic research from um, SEI and also work with Adaptation Without Borders and Cascades Initiative. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We move on very swiftly, actually, to the next speaker now, really listening in on, 
and, and hearing about the role of private sector and, and the perspective of private sector entities. Ashley Allen is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Oatly, uh, where she leads the company's movement towards a more climate smart food system. Ashley, we would like to hear from you. I mean, just listening in from what Kevin was talking about research and this findings, emerging, um, you know, research and, and, and science. What do you think of this cascading nature of climate risk and what does that mean for business and industry? And, and perhaps you can give us an idea in terms of the steps and measures you're seeing, uh, you know, the private sector take, where the strengths and potentially where the gaps are. Sounds good. Thank you, Ms. I really appreciate uh, your, your introduction and, and thank you so much to um, Adaptation Without Borders and SA, SEI and, and all the hosts uh, of this great event. Um, Kevin, I'm, I'm, I'd love to see your work on oats because, of course, as Oatly, uh, we are uh, an oat milk company, uh, a global company that um, produces uh, oat milk and related products uh, to replace dairy um, in markets around the world. And, and climate change is so close uh, to our mission and what we do. We also are a sustainability company, and that's really how we talk about Oatly and, and our role uh, in this space. Um, well, Musinda, cascading and um, the, the cascading and cross-border nature of climate risk. I almost can't say it. It's that's a really heavy and complicated topic. So maybe it's important to kind of break it down a little bit, um, because you know, for companies, the climate emergency is really about both trying to decarbonize and, and, and reduce our, our climate footprint, as well as build resilience in our business. Um, and, and the two really are two sides of the same coin. We, we uh, often think about them both together and, and really sort of private sector solutions are often sort of have both aspects of resilience and mitigation uh, woven in. So to me, when I'm really thinking about climate risk uh, from a business perspective, I like to look at it across the value chain and really kind of break it down into three areas. First of all, the extended supply chain, you know, what goes into our products, so the, the work that Kevin was really talking about, where you buy things, where they're grown, how you get them, where they go to, that's a, a critical piece of it. The second part is really your operations and production. How do you make whatever it is that you make and how can climate change impact that process? Um, and then finally, a, a space that a lot of people sort of forget when they're thinking about companies and, and climate change, how you get to your customers, the distribution, you know, how your product comes out and how you manage to get it into stores or into people's hands really can be impacted by, by climate change. And while this, for, for a global company, while looking at the value chain is really a global perspective, a global view, for each of these areas, what you then have to do to actually build resilience into the system are very much local solutions. So it's, it's that uh, ability to sort of both look globally and act locally um, that makes climate change and climate resilience such a challenge for companies, but is, is really just the approach that companies have to take uh, if we are going to uh, sort of persevere um, through these issues. So let me just give you a couple of, of specific examples. Um, first of all, in the extended supply chain. So I mentioned oats. You know, it it in some ways it can be as simple as just being very conscious about knowing where the oats that you buy are grown. Now that sounds like uh, a given, but not all companies know exactly where all their ingredients come from. So that's kind of number one, really having a, a detailed idea, not even just at the country level, not at the national level, but really uh, understanding what regions and areas um, these ingredients come from and, and then what kinds of environmental stresses uh, those, um, those ingredients might face throughout the year. That's super important. Now, once you understand those risks in the supply chain, perhaps you can mitigate that risk by buying, you know, ingredients from a number of different places. But as Kevin just told us, uh, spreading, you know, diversifying your supply, spreading out that risk may not always work. Um, and so, you know, one thing that Oatly's doing, an, an approach that we're taking is really looking at how is food grown? And we're aiming to drive a systemic shift in agriculture toward these more 
restorative or resilient practices. And so really working with farmers and kind of digging into how are the oats grown? What are the soil health practices? How can we work together and support them so that the decisions they're making in the growing process actually build resilience into the agricultural system so that those oats can actually withstand uh, more weather changes and withstand storms and, and the like, because that's so important. And also we can't forget about community resilience so that these farm communities that are actually responsible for growing the food that we eat, that they can actually um, you know, rely more on their crops and rely on, on that, that income um, so that they're not uh, sort of as negatively impacted when a storm or something comes through. So that's critically important. Now on the operation side, um, it's a little trickier to, to figure out what the, uh, the risks might be, especially if you're a global company with a number of production sites. But I'm gonna to turn to a quick example from uh, my, my previous um, position at Mars Incorporated. And, and we had a specific example where uh, we had a factory in Wodonga, Australia, that actually had to shut down production for a couple of days because the heat had gotten so extreme that it cost more to keep the factory running than we could actually make from producing the product there. And that's critically important because these kinds of weather risks at the individual site level are harder to put your finger on, harder to predict than, than looking at sort of like national level uh, risk patterns. And so, you know, just being uh, conscious of that and thinking about as we build production sites, not only where we're building them, but really what can you do within the production site to make sure that you have energy efficiency and, you know, the latest heating and cooling techniques and really uh, the type of facility that's going to be resilient, you know, a future factory, the type of facility that's going to be resilient to these big changes. That's absolutely key. And then finally, the third area of the value chain, uh, the distribution, um, it's much more dispersed. Uh, all of us companies have thousands and thousands of, of customers and hundreds of thousands of consumers. And, and so, you know, it's never possible to sort of put your finger on every possible risk, but you have to just be conscious that, you know, in the case of, you know, for example, a really active storm season uh, in the U.S., um, where you might have a lot of disruption and in, in, in people's inability to get to, to stores. Um, COVID is actually a really good uh, sort of example here where COVID itself isn't necessarily uh, caused by climate change, but it just illustrates, you know, what kinds of disruption can happen that can actually prevent people from getting to um, uh, your products that you're selling as a company. And, and you know, how companies can really weather that risk is by being agile and being aware of those kinds of changes that can happen and being able to make quick switches. So just another example from Oatly, um, during COVID, um, you know, we have a really dedicated, what we call our coffee channel, our coffee customers. So Oatly is a, a, a really popular product in coffee shops throughout uh, Europe and the US. And obviously with COVID, a lot of those coffee shops had to change their business model or even close down for some time. And we had to, to do a sort of two-pronged strategy where we were both reaching out to those customers, helping those coffee shops, just trying to sort of figure out together, is there a way to still um, keep them in business and get our product out there? What kind of help did they need? And at the same time, pivot uh, toward making sure our product was more available at retail where people were still going or online where people were ordering um, their, their groceries. So it's really, I think, about uh, companies of the future needing to be very agile, very flexible, and, and um, not sort of stuck in old business model, models, but able to anticipate um, that things are going to change even on a dime. The last thing I want to mention is, is, you know, as a company sort of looks through and plans how climate change or other big uh, impacts might affect them in their value chain, um, of course, we have to make sure that we're actually sharing that story, that, that we are um, improving trust and transparency uh, within our business and with our investors and our customers 
by disclosing these risks. And, and you know, the, the task force on climate related financial disclosures provides really good guidance on that aspect uh, of climate risk in the private sector, on that aspect of really sharing where your risks are, trying to estimate what those risks are, and just being really transparent that you are thinking about that, which then builds trust that as companies we're acting on, on this issue um, and that we're therefore more resilient and more um, uh, successful or have the higher opportunity uh, for success uh, in, in the face uh, of these changes. Um, so yeah, so I think that that's really the, the lesson to me is that it, it's not always uh, totally straightforward for a company to think about climate risk. Uh, it's also not necessarily as easy as just pulling up a, a computer model and, and showing you, you know, where the risks lie, because like I said, companies operate at a local level, but it's really about thinking through in a very detailed way, what are the material ways that climate change will affect your company? And then making sure that you have a plan, that you have some things put in place that can help you weather those risks. Thank you so very much, Ashley. My goodness, I mean, just listening to you about that example um, from your previous company at Mars and, how, you know, extreme weather events and what that can do to a business. And I think if there's a moment of, of reckoning, it's even now with the pandemic in terms of how do we think, as you rightly said, agile businesses, businesses that are anticipatory, but also businesses that have trust and transparency in their in their models. And I mean, a lot to think about, but I re really want to come back now to this energy issue. And our next uh, panelist is going to be talking a bit about that. Um, um, Tom Hose is the head of energy and environment data at, at the International Energy Agency. Tom, we would like to hear from you about the implications of cross-border climate risks in relation to electricity security. As we all know, I mean, even now as I'm in Nairobi, I need my power and my electricity. And, and, and really listening in on electricity, security and supply and how can we strengthen the resilience of our energy infrastructure with this kind of systemic risks. And before you just take the floor, I just want to invite everybody who's listening in from anywhere from the world, please put in your questions in the Q&A. We're just collating all of those and preparing them so I can have a Q&A right after this panel. Over to you, Tom. Hello, thank you and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone and uh, thanks for this opportunity to, to, to talk about uh, what all of the, the, uh, the cross-border effects mean for the energy sector. It's been very interesting to hear uh, from, from Kevin and Ashley about the different, uh, uh, the different sectors. Um, it's uh, it, all the complexities that you have of, of international agricultural trade are um, transferred to, to other sectors around the world. But, but there are differences. Uh, on the one hand, in agriculture, you've got to know where your oats come from. Um, in the electricity sector, you, uh, it's a little bit simpler to, for system operators to know where your electricity is coming from. But even so, um, you've still got some fairly fundamental questions that the system operators have to ask themselves about what are the risks that they are exposed to in terms of the supply of electricity and what, uh, does, what is, are the risks from climate change that can be imposed on those risks, whether the electricity is domestic or, or imported. And I think that's that's the first issue that's that's not uh, that's not always picked up um, in electricity systems around the world. Quite, quite what are the climate risks that people are facing? And they're clearly global. Um, we the data that we have um, shows, for instance, in the US, um, the extreme weather events there, whether these are we're talking heat waves, uh, wildfires, cyclones, flooding. Um, these are responsible for 90% of large scale electricity outages. And these are exactly the, the sorts of events we are uh, expecting to, to, to worsen and to multiply um, as the effect, effects of climate change grow. So these are known risks, um, but ex uh, expected to be growing risks. And the, the cross border uh, aspect is, can also be pretty clear given the, 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 the large scale flows of, of electricity across borders. We have a, a classic example of uh, of the Kariba Dam in in Zambia, um, and when there were there were uh, when there were droughts and, and threats to hydropower supply from in in this dam, that had a huge impact on Zambia, but also on on neighbouring Zimbabwe. Uh, these two countries were dependent on on uh, hydro for a third of their electricity, and the the, the cut in that supply uh, causes. Uh, 
enormous changes and disruption to the electricity sector directly, but then of course to the entire economy dependent on power supply. So you've got both, both, you've got both the, the direct consequences for the energy sector, but then that has feed through effects to the whole of the economy, which, which is disruptive. And there, I mean, you had, okay, you had reductions in investment, uh, you had changing to changes to, to investment profiles, um, you had a decline, decline in government revenues because public sectors are often involved in, in, uh, in, the, in the power sector. Um, so you, you had disruptions, uh, multiple types of disruptions throughout the, the entire power sector. Similarly, when we had uh, a tropical cyclone Idai in uh, that hit Mozambique, that then had uh, a feed through um, impact by disrupting transmission and distribution infrastructure. Uh, it cut power lines. There was a, a loss of a, uh, uh, over 1,000 megawatts of, of power flow to, to South Africa. Uh, and that then caused load shedding in South Africa and uh, an impact of crises there. So it's, uh, it's, it's relatively easy to, to see, see where the power is coming from and to, to, to reflect after the event what, uh, what the nature of the disruptions are. Um, but I think it's what's important, and that's next part of the, the question is, what can one do in terms of assessment and information to, to build in awareness of such vulnerability into the power systems? And there, um, in a sense, there, there's, there's good practice already um, around the world in different countries when it comes to looking at other environmental aspects. So there, whether you're talking the, the uh, World Bank environmental assessments for, for given projects um, or Europe's strategic environmental assessment framework, which is compulsory for all large new projects. In a sense, we have a framework that uh, already requires taking into consideration normal, if you like, normal environmental considerations. But in, we, we, we're still lacking in terms of adapting those frameworks for assessment and evaluation to climate change risk specific uh, um, risks and vulnerabilities. Um, there's quite a bit of that done in the EU. The EU, in a sense, is a, uh, um, a, a very dense model of a lot of interconnected cross-border electricity flows. Um, but at the same time, it has um, a almost unique cross-border assessment framework for, for looking at such risks. Uh, and in a sense, that's that's a good hint of, of where where we need to go. On the one hand, we want to keep the trade flows going. There are clear advantages to, to the international trade, whether it's in, in oats, agriculture or in power. Um, we don't want to have to suddenly become self-sufficient. That would be uh, imposed an enormous cost on the world. But we do need frameworks that take into consideration the cross-border supply dimension, um, whether that's a, a, a commonly agreed uh, assessment framework or evaluation framework, or, or simply requiring that national frameworks or even subnational assessment frameworks are uh, adapted and re reframed to, to take, up, take on board the, the cross-border assessment. And this is sometimes happening. We've got, well, we've got the EU examples, but we've also, for instance, got examples where um, international uh, aid agencies or, or development banks can, uh, can, can can build that framework into their assessment framework. Um, for instance, there's a, a good example of, of, of Laos um, working on a, a project of comprehensive vulnerability assessment with USAID. Um, there they, they created a framework which took that on board in their assessment of the local power sector. So there are some frameworks out there, but when we did our survey, and I just a flag for our book, we, we published a, a book looking exactly at power, power systems in transition um, with a whole section all about electricity security and climate change. And there, uh, strangely, we found of the, 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 fact, the countries in the IA family, about 38 countries, six, six have an explicit uh, recognition of growing climate change risks and the incorporation of such risks into the assessment of, of projects. Um, and that's clearly something that, that has to change. Uh, it's tricky because the, the, the costs and benefits of, of, of incorporating measures to address uh, such vulnerability and to build resilience into the system uh, are uneven. They're uneven across partners, but they're also uneven over time. The, the benefits of building resilience in is a long-term benefit, and it's spread from 
both the suppliers but also the consumers of electricity. So, and it's a classic case of you've got dispersed long-term benefits and that's difficult to monetize and, and to encourage incorporation into your one-off fixed capital expenditure now. But even so, these are risks that have to be built into our assessment framework um, so that the, the, and their resilience issues that can be incorporated into evaluations in the same way that uh, standard environmental assessments can be uh, brought into such a framework. But uh, our, our assessment shows that these, uh, there are examples around the world, but uh, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of incorporating these aspects into, into the framework. Um, but I think um, the models are there, um, but there's plenty of a, a, a clear way forward in terms of adapting our assessment frameworks to incorporate resilience. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Ironically, I actually do come from Zambia, and if there's a there's an experience in my country that we face. It's you know the dependence on hydroelectricity and the implications of droughts on our you know investment portfolio or let alone trading dynamics. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, and you are you really outlined the necessity that there's a lot of work needed, especially around the assessments that you've been undertaking. Thank you so very much for really flagging that. Um, the next speaker is going to be talking about you know our supply chains you know, trading, all these global supply chains, production systems, etc., and why they need to be resilient. However, it's also going to really reinforce the fact of why they need to be more balanced and also inclusive. Simonetta Zarelli is the chief of the Trade, Gender and Development Programme of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, which she has been leading since 2010. Under her leadership, the program provides analytical policy support to ANCTAD member countries on the gender implications of trade policy. But Simonetta also has been working with over 190 million women who work in factories, farms, processing facilities that supply the world's clothing, goods and food, and a lot of other products that come into our homes, into the very lives that we lead on an everyday basis. Simonetta, we are really curious to really hear from the work that you've been leading with your team and everyone else and different partners, how this cascading climate risks disproportionately impact women and girls, but also the opportunities that could perhaps you know, be realized by women's economic empowerment to pave the way for more resilient and a sustainable world. Over to you, Simonetta. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I am really pleased to, to participate in this debate. As you very kindly uh, said, I have been involved in the trade and gender work for a number of years. But before uh, um, having this responsibility within ANCTAD on trade and gender, I was working on environment related issues on trade and environment. Uh, so all these issues are very close to my uh, heart. Now, uh, in this, uh, in my intervention, I will try to put together trade, climate change, and gender equality. So let's see if I manage to uh, to uh, to set up good links, meaningful links among them. As you mentioned, women are very much involved in production. We know, for instance, that in agriculture, they represent over 60% of farmers in low-income countries, 30% in middle-income countries, but they are also very much involved in horticulture, in small fisheries, in aquaculture, etc. Women are also very much involved in other value chains, for instance, textile, clothing, footwear, where they represent roughly three quarters of uh, uh, the workforce. Now, what is uh, uh, what I would like to briefly talk about is what the private sector is doing and what the governments are doing to make uh, 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 the value chains more uh, more sustainable and more beneficial for trade and for gender equality. 
So as far as the private sector is concerned, I would like to refer to a surveys that was carried out a couple of weeks ago by the Economist Intelligence Unit. And this was a surveys in major producing countries. So for instance, USA, China, Germany, Italy, uh, Japan, etc. And the interviews was with uh, managers of those companies. And what emerges from the surveys is quite uh, uh, telling. For instance, only um, companies uh, 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 see uh, climate change as uh, an issue they want to pursue in the value chain. So only 23% of them see value, uh, see climate change as uh, something they have to, to encourage the suppliers through the value chain to pursue. And uh, only 28% uh, saw gender equality as uh, something they have to pursue. So we know that uh, customers make an impact, that uh, companies react to uh, uh, customers' wish, um, but uh, so many of these, uh, um, the way companies are uh, acting through the value chain is influenced by what the customers and what the public opinion, what the, uh, the civil society see as important goals to pursue. But there are also companies that completely escape this kind of pressure. For instance, if we think about small companies in developing countries, they may not be directly providers of the buyers, the big buyers. They may sell locally to other bigger companies, local companies still a big bit bigger that can be directly in the value chain. And these companies, these small companies may not feel any pressure from the buyers and may not feel pressure from the, co the final customers that can be geographically very far away from them. So in a way, the, uh, these companies may escape completely from any kind of pressure. And this leads me to, uh, to the second part. So this is what uh, companies do. This is what, how they try to influence their, uh, um, the companies that are in the value chains. But uh, uh, as I mentioned, climate change and gender equality doesn't seem to be very high among the goals they try to pursue. For instance, uh, uh, health and safety and recycling seem to be much higher in the, uh, in the kind of goals companies try to achieve. And when it comes to gender equality, is mainly about uh, ensuring equal pay for equal work or a flexible, uh, uh, flexible time arrangements, while, for instance, uh, uh, sourcing um, through women companies is not regarded at all as a goal to be pursued. Uh, while we know that this would be very important if companies try to, to source their inputs from companies led by or owned by, by women. Now, what are uh, uh, the other side of the coin is what the governments are doing. And we see that there are uh, two phenomena that uh, um, one is to include, and here I am referring to the uh, free trade agreements. As you know, free trade agreements are, uh, uh, there are many of them among the developed countries, among developing countries, and among the countries of the North and of the South. So, um, some of these uh, uh, um, free trade agreements, the FTAs, include the sustainability chapters and uh, a more recent phenomenon, they in some of them include the trade and gender chapters. So what, what we can learn from it is that uh, there is a wish to use the trade to pursue gender equality goals and to make sure that the trade does not become an impediment to climate resilience. Uh, so this is positive. New attention, uh, the phenomenon of the sustainability chapter came before the trade and gender chapters, but we see that there are commonalities between these two phenomena. And it is that these chapters are not the stronger, the strongest chapter chapters in the FTAs. 
Usually they are not uh, subject to dispute settlement. Uh, they, uh, they don't uh, contain goals that uh, the parties uh, to the agreement should reach. They limited themselves uh, to confirm uh, the commitments that the country's parties to the agreement have already taken, so within multilateral environmental agreements or within gender equality conventions. So there is no um, one step further is just confirming what the countries have already committed to to do. So while we we appreciate that uh, uh, including this chapter means that the trade is regarded as a tool to achieve uh, environmental resilience and uh, uh, gender equality, the way uh, they, this, these issues are treated without uh, uh, trade agreements is still uh, kind of a timid. Maybe in the future there will be a bolder way of, uh, uh, of addressing this issue. And my last point is that uh, what we really need, and it emerges from the interventions of the previous speakers, is that we need the coherence. Because if we have a, a gender chapter or a sustainability chapter in a trade agreement that is somehow um, diminished by the other chapters of the agreement, then we don't uh, we don't uh, get to uh, we don't reach the goals we would like to reach. So uh, coherence, uh, uh, climate change issue, environmental issues and gender equality issues cannot be addressed as standalone issues. They have to be addressed within the all other policies. If we, we don't have right agricultural, industrial, uh, labor, uh, social or education policies, we cannot uh, address properly uh, climate change and gender equality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simonetta. My goodness, those statistics are really shocking. 23% see climate change as really part of the value chain. 28% even consider gender equality in really looking at this. It's really shocking. But also, you rightly say, up to, you know, towards the end, the need to be bold, to make bold decisions in addressing some of these challenges that these global supply chains are, um, are obviously facing and the localities of issues as well. Thank you very much for really highlighting that. But before we turn on to the Q&A and the next session, um, um, we have two interventions, um, one minute interventions really to just hear about some of the practicality, some of the issues that are happening on the ground and what the realities are. And we're going to be hearing now, I'm going to turn to Alan uh, Sophia Asimwe, who is the CEO of Trademark East Africa based out of Uganda, I'm going to tell us a little bit in just a minute, some of the, you know, the experiences in the company uh, around this cascading climate risks. And then right after that, we're going to turn over to Galga um, Ndiaye, who's going to, who's the lead climate change specialist at the Islamic Development Bank. So I start with you, Alan, please. Thank you, Musonda. Coming from uh, hearing Simonetta and all those fascinating uh, uh, statistics she has given, uh, I thought I would also speak about the continental free trade area in Africa, the opportunities and risks. I think all stakeholders have talked about the transboundary risks and the impact these are likely to have on trade or the impact trade is likely to have on them. As we support the region to recover, all the governments are scrambling to try and do something to get jobs, to feed their people, to address the health risk. And so you find that there's a huge drive towards industrialization. There's a huge drive towards reshoring jobs here on the continent. There's a huge drive towards uh, building a lot of the manufacturing capacity and trading even more uh, because trade is being seen as a way to support recovery given the absence of economic recovery packages in our region. So my question to the panelists, and I don't know who will ask, who will answer this, but Ms. Shiro talked about keeping the momentum going. When our governments are struggling with these huge issues, how are we going to find the right incentives, the right champions, and the right strategies to actually get our governments and our big business and citizens back onto the road? Because we know without climate change being addressed, it will not be sustainable. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much, Alan, for that intervention. Dauda, over to you, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, good good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this was really um, 
sorry i i joined a little bit late but um from 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 what i followed i think uh, some key aspects that we discuss here relate for example to how do you make sure that within the countries you have you have the right policies in place that would uh, you know uh, lead to having automatically these uh, climate risks being uh, being uh, being addressed and also we 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 discuss some of the existing frameworks out there that could be used um, uh, by um, development banks like us and um, this is our challenge. This is our challenge that we deal more and more with um, um, global value chains, and we are supporting we are supporting countries in um, in um, in a single way. You know, we are supporting one country into getting into one global value chain. So, how do we ensure that what we are investing in within that country is resilient? I think we have the tools now. We have developed the, the tools within the bank to, to make sure that all of our investments are climate resilient. But now, how do we ensure that um, throughout the value chain in other countries that we are not supporting, that this, this resilient investment is going to cascade throughout the value chain? So that's one of the, one of the key issues that we have here. And uh, it's good that we have uh, um, um, mechanisms and coalitions like uh, the TCFD, uh, all of those, those investors, all of the banks, all of the development banks, all of the commercial banks, the big financial institutions coming together with having um, uh, harmonized approaches to address climate risks, which will uh, give us some assurance that when, when we are investing in, in, uh, in, uh, in climate resilient infrastructure or climate resilient value chain, that down the line, the, the other financial institutions that are involved and also at the country level, uh, we have that uh, commitment to look at um, climate, climate risks. So I think that's, that's a challenge we have and that's a question I have for you uh, at, the, at the panel how can we together address these issues? And like I said, we already see that there are many uh, um, coalitions uh, coming together. Like and as MDBs, we have the joint MDB working group and, and we are going beyond uh, that aspect. We are clearly harmonizing all of our, all of our approaches to be Paris aligned, but now the, the other financial institutions, how, mm -hmm. how do we address that? Thank Great. You. Well, thank you so very much to you and Alan for those interventions. Just in the interest of time, I'm going to ask all of the panelists and thank you for your amazing interventions, some questions so you reflect on them because we're about to have another keynote um, address and right after the keynote address, we're going to have the Q&A. Just for you to just, you know, keep those questions at the back of your minds and maybe uh, think through the, the, the answers. There's a question here to you, Ashley. Um, you seem to be doing great efforts around sustainability and resilience in your work. However, I wonder what your thoughts are about letting Blackstone, the famous deforestation in the Amazon, invest in your company. Don't they work actively against what we are discussing here today through their practices that your profits are now contributing to? That's for you. And a question, a question now to Kevin. Um, as countries and companies might seek to spread risk by diversifying their supply base, what implications might this have for farmers? Is there any evidence from past trends that their such action has increased or decreased risk for individual farm businesses? We have another question here to everyone. These three questions are for everyone to reflect. How can governments and private sector work together to address climate risks across agricultural value chains, especially in developing countries. Are there any best practices you could share? Another question from Ruben Roosevelt. Um, the question here is data transparency is a key for traceability, risk management, and to hold companies responsible. How do we get companies to be more transparent and work towards more collaborative and less competitive approach? Another question to everyone, lastly, but not the least, of course, there are more questions coming in. Can, uh, this one is from Miguel, 
can we expect companies to seriously take into account their impacts on the planet and the people when their main concern is to make money? And are they and they are only taxed on that dimension? This is very interesting. So some food for thought before we go into the Q&A session. Now I have the opportunity to introduce another keynote speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Pema Geshot, who is uh, Jamsha, who is from Bhutan, but also happens to be the Director General of ECMOD and based in, in Kathmandu. Um, he's going to be really telling us a bit about the work in terms of what they're doing around global risks, the private sector responses to global risk, and how COVID and climate change are obviously shortening supply chains or divesting from risky places. How can we not increase the vulnerability of already vulnerable groups and push people into poverty? So over to you to give us your keynote, please, Emma. Uh, thank you very much, Sandra. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm speaking from Kathmandu. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to be part of this race to zero, and I hope we are raising together. Can I have the first slide, please? Well, I will uh, talk to you about the Hindu Kush Himalayan region in particular, because we are in a very particular situation of having these upstream, downstream linkages, where the goods and services flow from both ends in a vertical uh, direction. You know, from upstream, the goods flow down to the south in the plains, and then the supplies from the plains are uh, flow up to the mountains. So this uh, particular situation that we are in in the Hindu Kush Himalayan. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So I'm going to give you a brief background of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region because some of you may not be familiar with the specific cities or that this region is facing. Then I would like to give an overview of what we understand by supply chains in these mountains and what are the niches, the niche advantages that this region has. And then the emerging responses or the actions that are being taken by our regional member countries and the actions that are being planned to address, uh, to build inclusive and resilient supply chains and how easy mode is approaching this whole process. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, I'm sure everybody knows the Hindu Kush Himalayan region covers an area of 4, 4 million square kilometers spanning across eight countries from Afghanistan, Pakistan, China, Nepal, India, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. And you also know that 10 of Asia's major rivers has their sources in this region. And it provides livelihood to 240 million people directly who live in the mountains and hills but also supports the livelihood of over 1.6 billion people living downstream. Next slide, please. Well, I need to highlight this because this region is highly vulnerable to global warming. Even in a 1.5 degree centigrade world, you would be still talking about Hindu Kush Himalayas being very hot. We would still expect uh, temperature rise of up to 2.1 degrees centigrade. But if we carry on with business as usual, we are going to experience a temperature rise of 5.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. So you can see how critical it is for us to take actions in this region. Uh, next slide, uh, please. So this is, uh, now let me explain to you what mountain supply chains mean to us. We're also talking about tourism. Tourism is one of the key economic sectors and that benefits almost every uh, part of this region. Energy, I heard the uh, previous speaker talking about energy. There is hydropower energy flow downstream as well as uh, upstream flow of other sources of energy like fossil fuel and uh, liquid nitrogen gas, and so on. In agriculture, we are talking about small farmers producing potatoes and other crops for export to our areas, and then bulk of the food supply comes from our areas. And of course, labor supply goes in both ways. 
uh, Himalayan region depends quite a lot on remittance from providing labor outside the region, but it also depends on labor from outside for building its infrastructures. Now I'm going to focus much more on the small, medium, and micro enterprises because 95% of the private sector here comprises of this kind of industries or this kind of enterprises, and it is largely in the informal sector. Our mountain supply chains are very vulnerable to climate change because we experience increasing incidences of floods, windstorms, snowstorms, drought, etc., and which damages our infrastructure like roads and bridges, you know, even market structures. So this affects not only the producers but also the traders, the transporters, and of course the consumers. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit our mountain economy very hard. Economic growth has declined by 20 to 30 percent in key sectors like tourism. Uh, for example, the tourism sector in countries like Bhutan and Nepal has come to a standstill. And as you know, along with it, all the service industries like hotels, restaurants, so leading to a large number of people being displaced or being unemployed or you know, being laid off. So this has led to increasing poverty, increasing unemployment in the region, and this has affected mostly women and those at the lower rung of the society. Next slide, please. Well, there's a lot of potential for us to build a resilient economy. The Himalayas have a huge diversity of plants, animals, and so on, but we need to now go towards nature-based solutions and take advantage of the niche crops and the niche advantages that it offers. So if you look at the next slides, uh, can I have? Yes, so we can go for enterprises like this. This is a syrup produced out of ground apple. It's called yakun somewhere else, elsewhere. And this is a socially responsible enterprise with a good market uh, value because it is uh, considered to cure diabetes. So it has got health benefits. With proper branding and quality control, this could be a very lucrative enterprise for many small farmers in the mountains. Uh, in the next slides, we can probably think of what uh, the earlier speaker, I think Ashley, mentioned about Oddly. So this is the Himalayan version of the Oddly. So it's a it's called cordyceps or uh, it's a caterpillar, it's a fungus that is supposed to have high energy value and supposed to boost your immune system. So value addition to this kind of uh, niche, uh, niche biodiversity or niche genetic resources could be a potential nature-based solution for small small farms in the uh, Next slide, please. Well, what are our countries in the region doing? It, with the outbreak of the pandemic, we were totally got prepared. I think most countries were totally got prepared. With lockdowns happening, with supply chains cut off, there were a lot of hoarding, even good commodities like rice, a lot of hoarding of human sold, then price hiking, hogging, smuggling, all sorts of things have happened because there was no awareness. And now different governments have resorted to different mechanisms of addressing the problem. In Bhutan, for example, where I come from, we have resorted to welfare schemes, employing those who are laid off in other sectors, and providing also loan waivers and instant financial incentives to support the people who have taken off jobs and their families. And some other countries like Pakistan have resorted to you know, uh, paying people for planting trees. And other countries have also increased their investment in organic agriculture and so on to boost self-sufficiency. But overall, the hindu Himalayan countries are committed to a green recovery in the post-COVID era. Uh, next slide. Now we have come up with a set of actions to build inclusive and resilient supply chains. 
and this include on organizing and prioritizing the uniqueness of different supply chains. I have two examples. Then scaling up social protection systems to support enterprises in the informal sector. Scaling up nature-based solutions to strengthen the resilience of supply chains, deliver inclusive and climate responsive financial services. For example, the digital financial services that is being uh, provided in China is I think, a solution to many of the financial goals that our small mountain farmers are facing. Enabling resilient entrepreneurial ecosystems, developing resilient infrastructure. Maybe in some places we need to relocate the infrastructure from where they are just now because they have grown fresh floods and so on. And then developing sustainable and inclusive labor markets. And we have to cooperate at all levels to build inclusive and resilient supply chains. Uh, next slide, please. Now, how do you came to this set of actions? The past few years, Isimoth has conducted a very comprehensive assessment of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region in terms of the impact climate change would have on its economy, on its society, and particularly on its ecosystems. Based on that, we have come up with the SKH call to action a roadmap that would lead us away from this path of destruction, away from the path of bloom, to first a path prosperity and this is now reflected in this document for the Hindu Kush Himalayan Action Plan. I'm showing both the publications here so those of you who are interested may refer to them. Now we have hope here and that is because our governments have committed to taking these actions for uh, can I can I have the biggest uh, slide please uh, just can you go back to the previous slide because our governments are really committed to work together and to take this process forward. Recently, on October 15, we have what we call the Hindu Kush Himalayan Ministerial Mountain Summit 2020, where ministers from the eight countries signed a declaration to implement this call to action, which consisted of six urgent actions to address climate change issues. Thank you very much for allowing us to participate in this uh, race to zero. And as I said in the beginning, let us race together to reach zero. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pema Kadinchella. Um, I just want to now really go very quickly to the Q&A because I know that people are anticipating and waiting for their answers to, to you know, their questions to be answered. I have one last question for Simonetta, just in the interest of time. We've got like 15 minutes for this Q&A. Simonetta, there's a question for you. Do you have a concrete example of a, of, a, of a free trade agreement that takes gender equality into account? And how are the parties looking, for, uh, looking to implement that? So we can start with the initial question, the first one with Ashley, and then the general questions with everyone, and then come to Simonetta. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm really glad that, that someone brought up uh, investment in finance. We haven't talked about much in, in this panel, but obviously uh, making uh, global finance more sustainable is absolutely critical to this whole issue. I mean, we cannot meet the climate emergency without directing finance to the right sustainable investments. And that's exactly what's behind uh, Oatly's relationship with all of our investors, our, our many investors, including Blackstone, is really demonstrating that even for some of the largest private equity firms in the world, that where they should put their money is into sustainable companies like Oatly. And that by showing that when they invest in sustainability, when they invest in a company that prioritizes sustainability, people and the planet over profit, that they will see those uh, returns, that they will see that that growth and then therefore gain confidence to, to invest in more companies that are prioritizing sustainability. And I think that the, the trends are showing us that that this is the case and it's and, it, and these the trends of uh, companies that prioritize ESG actually performing better. Uh, during this COVID period than, um, than uh, average companies. 
is really showing investors that they should be paying attention uh, to this space. Um, it's also related, I, I would just want to answer this, this question about um, the right incentives uh, and, and, and how are our companies really supposed to address these issues if they're only prioritizing profit. I think that's also exactly right. And I think more and more companies are waking up to the fact that you can't be as successful by only focusing on short-term profit. You, in fact, must prioritize people in every decision you make in order to be successful uh, in the future, especially in light of these big risks like climate change. Thank you for that response, Ashley. There was a, there was a question to Kevin. Kevin, do you remember your question? Yeah, thanks so much, Masanda. Uh, I do remember it. It was a bit about um, how, as companies begin to realize that they have risks embedded in their supply chains, what sort of effects are we likely to see in in the case of, of farmers and producers in particular. Um, I'm really glad that, that somebody asked this because this is one of the, the things that as a researcher in this space uh, that is focused a lot on, on developing countries and the experiences of vulnerable communities that, that I think is, is essential. Um, we can imagine a case, uh, for example, of a company that identifies a risk in their supply chain in an already vulnerable community to climate change and says, that's not for us. We would rather not be involved in this space. That's a risk. And they go ahead and they sell off that farm, be it a coffee farm, a banana plantation, who knows what. Uh, and then you have an instance where a community that's already directly vulnerable to climate change is also losing key sources of income of livelihoods, which which is essential. And they sort of have a, a, a double risk from this uh, attempted adaptation by a company. So I think that this is a major concern and something we need to be really focused on and, and worried about as researchers that are interested in policy solutions in, in this space. Um, whether or not we've seen it happen so far, uh, the challenge in that is because th this is sort of a new and emerging issue. Companies are only just beginning to recognize climate risks in, in those contexts, but we have certainly seen uh, in terms of risk management, companies do sorts of things like this all the time for, for other non-climate risks. So I think that there's there's reason to be worried. Um, one of the things that we've been thinking a little bit about at, at SCI is this idea of a just transition for climate risk and resilience. We've been thinking a lot over the last several years about what it means to have a just transition in the mitigation space. How do we come down off of fossil fuels, but make sure we're prioritizing vulnerable communities in that process, those fossil fuel workers. And I think that the same thing is true in this context as we're beginning to try to build up resilience and as we transition away from, from risky production methods, how do we make sure that those communities and those actors aren't going to be left behind? Um, so I think that this is a really key critical issue and, and it comes back to exactly what Ashley was just saying, is that we need to be figuring out how do we make investing in resilience a core part of companies' business? How do we make sure that they recognize that, that this is essential to remaining profitable in the long term? And what sorts of activities can governments and policymakers do to make sure that those incentives are, are in line? So, so this is certainly a key issue and, and I'm glad that we brought it up and, and there's a lot more work and innovation needed in the policy space to make sure that those incentives are, are aligned, in my opinion. Thanks. Great, great. And to all the other panelists, um, these three questions, that one that came from Dennis, I think you remember the one on governments and private sector working together to best address climate risk across agriculture value chains, especially in, in developing countries. Um, you know, what practices are best from Ruben, the data transparency issue, traceability, risk management. How can we hold companies, you know, responsible for this? More transparent, more collaboration, less competitive approach. And from Miguel, the issue of can we expect companies to seriously take into account their impacts on the planet and people? So any thoughts? Maybe we can start with Tom. I think you're muted. Hi. Sorry, yes, I was muted. Um, yeah, I think, well, I think one thing to acknowledge is that uh, there is quite a lot of incentive on the part of the private sector uh, to, to be aware of its supply chain and, and, and the risks and vulnerability to its supply chains. So in, in some sense, there's, there's a, a, um, a private motivation to, to respond uh, to such uh, threats and risks and to address them. Um, but at, at the same time, there are broader risks and I flagged up that there are either long term and dispersed benefits of, of addressing resilience, which which aren't normally taken into consideration. And there, yes, there I think a, a public sector framework is useful, 
to, to, to bring in such considerations uh, in, into, into the framework, whether that's in a regulatory manner or um, in, in a, a more uh, voluntaristic approach, for instance, yeah, through cooperation with um, development banks and and uh, uh, who, for instance, create create the, their own framework for for any given project pipeline. So I think there are different ways of, of incorporating it into a framework. Great. Any thoughts, Simonetta? And then you can also respond to that question that was asked for you directly about the free trade area. Example of that. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, there are uh, there is this new phenomenon or having a trade and gender chapters included in the free trade agreements. We have uh, uh, trade and gender chapters uh, in the Chile Uruguay FTA, Canada Chile FTA, Canada Israel FTA. So there are a number of recent uh, FTAs uh, that include this uh, uh, this chapter. So as I said, this is. Uh, new positive development, these uh, FTAs are recent, so we cannot uh, still assess what has been uh, the impact, um, but uh, is for sure a sign that the trade community is uh, seeing uh, a trade as one of the instruments that uh, can be used for achieving uh, um, common uh, goals. And uh, another uh, interesting development is that uh, uh, in, I mean, the EU for years has been conducted the uh, sustainability impact assessments during the negotiations of the trade agreements. So these, uh, these assessments look at what could be the overall impact of uh, uh, a new trade agreement on uh, the economy, on environment and on the gender equality. So, um, the, this means that we are kind of, and these impact as, uh, assessments are becoming more, are taking a more important uh, place during the negotiations. And this shows uh, as well the intention of making sure that an a trade agreement is not only assessed from uh, uh, GDP growth or employment growth, but is also assessed about uh, who will employ it? So who, who, who are the losers? Who are the winners? How the impact will be on the environment? So um, in a way, this is a rebalancing the uh, trade, uh, uh, trade flows, economic growth with the achievements or uh, the achievement of other goals like gender equality and uh, um, environmental preservation. The same is going on, for instance, for Canada. Canada uh, does a specific uh, gender assessment of all uh, new uh, trade agreements uh, uh, it negotiates. The, these are, as I said, these are a bit at timid steps, but you need to start from something to achieve uh, better mm -hmm. results. Now, uh, moving to um, uh, one of the, the, the questions that was uh, where we find the champions. And I think this is a very important question. For instance, if we look at what the countries are doing in to react to the pandemic and to all the, uh, the economic uh, negative impact of the pandemic, we um, on one hand, we see that women have been particularly badly affected because they work mm -hmm. in the value chains that have been specifically affected, like uh, tourism, hospitality, uh, textile. Apparently, people don't buy clothes any longer because they don't go to work. They, they work at home, so they don't buy clothes any longer. Uh, so they have been particularly affected. They have a huge problems in accessing to in accessing credit, and this is uh, in a period of crisis. You need the credit to make your mm -hmm. enterprise survive. And still, if you look at the measures put in place across regions and countries, very few measures target specifically women. Though measures that target SMEs or the informal sector indirectly uh, target women because they are very much uh, present in the informal sector and in SMEs. So mm -hmm. to come back to the question, we really need the champions because uh, mm -hmm. If we say something and when it is time to act, we do something different, 
um, reaching the goals, the sustainable development goals will be really far away. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much, Simonetta. Really, I mean, if, if there's anything that we've seen in this pandemic, it's exactly as you've articulated it, how women have suffered along the value chain, especially those, you know, particularly most of them are in the informal sector, really. Um, it's been quite a problematic dynamic, but thank you so much for talking a lot about finding of champions. I really want to thank all the speakers from the very beginning, um, our, our UNFCCC uh, champion, Nigel Topping, and the keynote speaker, Mr. Oi and all the other panelists for this just charged and fantastic quick fire reflections on these cascading risks of climate um, risk within the global supply chains. It's been absolutely fantastic listening to you. And this is the final keynote speak from a mountainous region. I mean, how they even managed to get products across this beautiful mountain range and yet complex uh, in how we deal with that. And if there's anything that's emerged from this discussion and also your responses to the questions, is really how COVID-19 has been a test run for the world and why climate risks, you know, should we have a mega global climate disaster? How can we be ready? And so in this next segment, we're going to be really having some fantastic discussion. We have a fantastic speaker sitting in Hong Kong right now. Good evening, Eileen. Eileen Gallagher is the Associate Director at the Business for Social Responsibility, and she leads BSR's climate change practice in Asia. So she's working very closely with companies to decarbonize and build climate resilience across the value chains. So we'd like to hear from you, Eileen. Thank you so very much for taking part in today's conversation. And we want to hear from you what are some of the key takeaways for the private sector and also your experience in Asia. Well, thank you so much for having me. And at BSR, we work with some of the world's largest um, and well-known companies to advance sustainability and climate action. Uh, in the private sector and across value chains. So I'll reinforce a few things that I heard today, and I just want to point to a, a, a couple distinct action items to leave you with. Uh, as expressed in this dialogue, COVID-19 has shown how easily global value chains can be disrupted. So these sorts of shocks, the impacts of COVID and the impacts of climate change can lead to cascading impacts on communities and workers that are vital for sourcing in markets. And as Ashley mentioned earlier, companies need to look at how climate change is affecting uh, their business globally, but building resilience needs a localized approach. Risks are unique to a local market and solutions need to be tailored accordingly. And as we're seeing with COVID, the most vulnerable and marginalized have been and will continue to be the hardest hit amid a changing climate. And we've heard that in several of the remarks uh, today. So protecting the most vulnerable from climate risks in company operations and supply chains is absolutely essential in our race to zero building resilience. And like the health crisis, the business community can play a leading role in protecting the most vulnerable by identifying ways in which they may be impacted and designing approaches to mitigate against those potential negative harms. Value chain risk management should be performed uh, through systemic assessments and conducted from top to bottom to ensure that uh, due attention is given to stakeholders on the ground. Uh, as we heard, such assessments should be conducted at the sourcing level, throughout operations and production, and in distribution, so how companies are reaching their, their customers and their consumers. The recommendations from the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or the TCFD, has really become that de facto standard for the private sector on climate risk management. Uh, the recommendations have the support of over a thousand organizations across all business sectors, um, and they're being used not merely as a disclosure framework, but also as a climate risk management framework. So uh, businesses are indeed starting to take this seriously. Um, they do want to know where those potential risks are. They're pulling in different departments within organizations to assess those risks collaboratively. And we're finding that the most helpful and, and maybe the most challenging element um, of the TCFD is, is conducting a scenario analysis. 
Now, scenarios have long been used by businesses and governments to improve decision making under conditions of uncertainty. So rather than basing decisions on single point forecasts in the future, companies are considering a set of plausible alternative futures uh, to help shape more adaptive and resilient strategies. So conducting a scenario analysis with a climate lens can help a company challenge itself to think more strategically. strategically. Mm -hmm. So to break away from that linear thinking that our brains are wired to do and to think more strategically about the longer term climate risks and the opportunities across its value chains. Mm -hmm. Yes, the supply chains can enable the transmission of risks, but it can also help to view the, the inter interconnectedness of opportunities. So for MNCs to work with the MN SMEs, the small to medium enterprises in their supply chain, to work with the most vulnerable, to build capacity, strengthen skills, share tools, resources, implement best practices for stronger risk management. Um, ultimately, uh, we should leverage company efforts to build resilience to uplift the most marginalized in our supply chains. Uh, mm -hmm. To say, as was mentioned, ensure a just transition in our mitigation and adaptation efforts. Uh, to build company value chains and communities that sustain each other and thrive in the face of climate change, we at BSR established uh, the Global Value Chain Risk to Resilience Collaborative Initiative. Uh, so we're working with a set of companies now to better understand how uh, we can better build resilience. So through, through more strategic risk assessments and scenario analysis, again, aligned with the TCFD, um, but also through the development of methodologies, metrics. So we're really moving from theory to practice. Uh, mm -hmm. We're moving this work forward as we speak uh, and eager to share our progress with you to, to more broadly scale climate resilience and, and share some of those practices within the private sector. So ultimately what is, is clear with this pandemic is that there is a need uh, to build resilience to shocks across value chains, um, but the focus needs to not only be the resilience to the business, but also on the communities and the people that businesses fundamentally rely on and serve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen. That's really interesting, moving from theory to practice. It's really good to hear about the assessments work that you've been involved in and getting to gather all that information and data. Thank you so much for that. We're now going to turn to um, Jimmy Adum, who is the Executive Secretary of the Permanent Interstates Committee for Drought Control in the Sahel, and also a former Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation of Chad, and also happens to be the Adaptation Without Borders Ambassador. Jimmy, you are sitting in the Sahelian region and we hope that you've enjoyed discussions today. So what are some of the actions and recommendations do you draw on on how to achieve just transition and a resilient world and also the role of regional bodies and organizations? Well, thank you very much. Uh, when I, I didn't know what I was getting myself into uh, when I accepted the uh, <laughs> to be ambassador without a board. No, seriously. Uh, I, I love the opportunity, the challenges, and you know, it used to be an easier course of action because we've been in this for maybe the last 25 to 30 years. And then COVID came along and it threw out everything that we knew. And so what I've been hearing since this morning is quite uh, uh, heartening in a sense that there are people who are really devoting serious time and efforts and energies and money to be able to at least still look at the direction of those who are more most vulnerable, let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. So from what I heard so far, it, it gives me great pleasure to maybe add just a couple of things because everything has been said. So if we speak about resilience, uh, I'm going to say that the only thing I want to add is that Resilience needs to start from the bottom up, from the, the from the mom and pops in a corner, not necessarily the smallest of the smallest, but at least local knowledge needs to be taken into consideration, taken into the picture. And because there are uh, a bunch of uh, data that did show, for instance, uh, when COVID came in, 
We in this region scrambled hard and adapted and developed a few survival mechanisms because borders were closed, free goods and services were not moving anymore. So what have we learned? And that needs to be looked at, incorporated, and then scaled up and out. And so that knowledge is really key. What I uh, want to add here is that I think uh, taken separately, all of us have really some good ideas and technology, but let me read and so on. Maybe we should focus on some of the key areas of the world. I'm not saying just uh, pull the blanket to Sahel and West Africa. I'm just saying from the experiences mm -hmm. we have learned, listening to uh, all the great speakers that have talked this morning, we need to develop a strategy whereby producers, private sector, research, policymakers, donors, everybody sits at the table, organize mm -hmm. uh, an event, a two-day event, a one-day event, a one -day event. I don't know. We have to design it. We have to map it out so that everybody puts in or puts in the balance what the, the angle from which they are looking at this thing. Resilience, sustainability, uh, building uh, uh, robust systems. How do we operate from <laughs> now on? Because COVID is with us for a little while. And then, from the standpoint of uh, my takeaway from the regional bodies, uh, we at SILS, for instance, we have 13 member countries for SILS. We bring the likes of uh, ECOWAS and then EUMA. So, we are servicing about 17 countries in this region. And we've had quite a bit of experience. And if we see that this, how do we uh, attack risk? How do we mitigate? How do we manage the effects of drought and desertification? We have had a lot of experience. And then recently, as you well know, there is a Gersang Sahel that has been created and it is really attracting a lot of interest. And so with respect to that and drought control, transboundaries, we have water resources issues and we have worked a lot of these things. So maybe what we need to do is uh, sort of come together. Uh, we can bring to balance, put in the bucket of uh, this big uh, uh, network that has been developing, and uh, we should be able to really uh, add some value to uh, the enthusiasm and the likes of which uh, uh, the problems that people are attacking. And then for all of that, I'm really honestly very proud and elated, delighted to be designated as the one of the ambassadors for adaptation with our board. May the force be with us. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. No, really good to hear about, you know, the essence of really building robust systems and how you've highlighted the role of regional bodies and also bringing together points of convergence and discussions and really making sure that, you know, we're having discussions more transparently and openly. And, and in fact, you brought up the issue of the Great Green Wall. We're actually going to be working on it as part of the UN Decade on Exodus and Restoration that brings in together all the conversations that we've, you know, we've been having here. Thank you very much for really highlighting that. And I want to move on to the next speaker, and I'm delighted to welcome um, Ambassador, His Excellency um, Chad Blackman, who's the Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Barbados to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva and who has worked in the international development sector for well over 15 years, is an international trade law um, specialist and is also the chair of the WTO Environmental Committee. And to welcome um, other colleagues, but we have another speaker who hasn't joined us and we're just waiting um, for him to come on board. Ambassador Blackman, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, sort of as you've listened into some of these conversations and as we look to the future, why are climate risks so important to consider in trade policies, laws and agreements? And what steps should we be taking or could be taken to strengthen the resilience of our economies and trade flows to climate change? Well, thank you very much and allow me to say thank you to the organizers for having me this morning uh, to what in my mind has in many respects been a very robust and rich and quite relevant debate, particularly given what's happening in the world. Now, given the short time, I'll pretty much outline from my perspective a very short roadmap on how I think we can mobilize the trade and environment uh, communities to address this issue. Now, the importance of ensuring that climate risks are considered in bilateral, regional and global trade policies. Uh, additionally, laws and agreement cannot be understated. The external shock that COVID-19 has been to the global community 
has really shown to my mind um, that we ought to ensure that trade agreements must, uh, as a matter of course, have with them the built-in flexibilities that allow for member states as well uh, as well as uh, the private sector to have provisions um, to be able to access the ne necessary policy space to be able to mitigate these risks. Now, this is no different to climate change. And for example, uh, the government of Barbados has over the course of the last two years, as a matter of policy, uh, mandated that all international agreements that we sign on to, particularly with a pecuniary interest um, involved, that there must be a clause in that contract or international agreement that allows for derogation of obligation in circumstances where climate change has caused for that uh, agreement not to be able to be performed. Um, in our part of the world, and in many parts of the world in terms of uh, SIDS, both in the Caribbean and Pacific region, we are faced every year with the situation of Category 4 or Category 5 hurricanes. It therefore means the incidence of our businesses being affected and our entire economies is incredibly high, so that's important. The other aspect that I really want to touch on is the whole aspect of when you're getting, when you're asking the global business community to ensure that their supply chains are resilient, you're talking about models of business that have existed for the last, let's say, three, four decades. And you're now asking them in a very short period of time to change their models so as to, 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 to be resilient in a short period of time. There, there then has to be a, a global mechanism that allows for the refinancing of uh, uh, how, how businesses are, are set up. Because to move from one mode of operation to the next will require a serious level of capital Many um, businesses, perhaps in the developing world, are not able to, to tap into that. So the international community, perhaps institutions like the International Trade Center based in Geneva, the World Trade Organization and OCTAD, um, must provide the sort of uh, architecture that allows for the private sector, particularly small and medium sized businesses, to be able to tap into the resource to ensure that they can move from one mode uh, of operation to the next. And then lastly, very important, uh, regional uh, blocks will be critical. Many small states have um, their businesses in one jurisdiction, but that brings a high level of risk because, for example, if there's an earthquake or there's a, a hurricane, your entire, mm -hmm. entire supply chain is dis destroyed. If you spread that risk across geographical um, uh, jurisdictions under a regional trade agreement, you allow, therefore, for that risk, therefore, to be spread. So these are some of the sorts of things that I think will be necessary. And then next week, incidentally, the WTO will be having its WTO uh, Trade and Environment Week. And I would really in, invite all of uh, the persons listening here to tap into some of those events because it's going to be a high level of discussion uh, with a number of players across the international community, including um, your UNEP, of which you are a part, to ensure that the, the global conversation on how do we move forward and how do we uh, rebuild better, particularly in circumstances where COVID-19 has served a major disruption of supply chains and value chains. That conversation is necessary. So they want to thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Ambassador Blackman. I mean, you really highlight the, the, the actual, you know, challenges that already the small island developing states in the Caribbean and Pacific face uh, with just climatic disruptions. And now with the pandemic and the complexity of landscapes, in fact, we should be learning from you on some levels of preparedness and building back better and thinking forward on that. Um, we, have had, we have had over 200 participants participating, I think still listening into this session. Please, as you've heard, next week is going to be Trade and Environment Week. Join in, check out the website for WTO, which is really fantastic. We need to listen in some of these conversations. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn to Martin Freak, who is going to be telling us and, and, and really talking about the issue. He is the um, uh, Deputy Special Envoy on the UN Secretary General for the UN Secretary General for the 2021 Food Systems Summit, which was previous, and he used to be uh, previously the director, senior director of policy and program coordination at UNFCCC, but also the director of climate and energy and tenure division in FAO before. Martin, welcome. And now, just you know, you've listened into all of these conversations, and we've heard about all these supply chains. I think there was even an, a question um, earlier on from a panelist about food systems and and challenges and productions of these supply chains and and the complexity of all of this, of bringing the very food farm to fork. Yet better, our food systems are critical in the effort to build a better and resilient future and improved health, 
equality and peace. Mm -hmm. So how can we all work together to strengthen the resilience of the global um, food supply chain and what role is the Food Systems Summit going to play in that? Well, thank you very much. And it was a fascinating discussion this morning. And I particularly appreciated so many different aspects. Um, what I most appreciate is that, you know, all of the panelists have not forgotten what the departure point is. We are living in a time where climate justice is not just a formula, it's a reality every single day that those who have contributed at least to the problem are affected most with the impacts of climate change. And the COVID crisis again is exacerbating the pressures and the pain of those people who are already under so many different pressures. The point has been made <clears throat> of women being affected exproportionately. They always are. It's a heartbreak if you think about it, because whatever crisis comes along, it is always adding more burdens on the most vulnerable. And, you know, that needs to orient our working and our doing. Now, the Food System Summit is an SDG summit. It's um, convened by the Secretary General, really in the recognition that we only have 10 years left to reach the 2030 um, goals. And, you know, obviously, Goal number one and goal number two are sort of the headline of all of the rest of the SDGs because there is no resilient and fair and stable world with poverty mm -hmm. and so many people in dire food insecurity. And the answer to that is certainly that in food systems, as anywhere else, but in food systems particularly, resilience is not an add-on, it's not an afterthought. It's not the icing on the cake. It is the very substance of what we are doing. Mm -hmm. You've just heard that it has to start from the bottom up, but it also needs guidance and it needs finance from the top down. And so what we are trying to do in this Food System Summit is basically to go away from this classic way of doing a summit, which is one high level day and then there's a preparation process and maybe a, a bit of an aftermath, but really to create something that is a one year broad systemic engagement process. Um, and this comes basically um, on a global level in five action tracks, which we have designed in order to come together as a system. The five action tracks are access to safe and nutritious food, the second one is the change to sustainable diets. The third one is a shift to nature positive production. The fourth one is um, to build better livelihoods in the food system supply chains. And the fifth one is resilience. And when I'm counting those, it's obvious that none of those will work without the other. And as the SDGs are a coherent system, um, these five action tracks will look together with a lens of systemic transformation of the food systems. Um, we will have three cross-cutting levers of change where we particularly intensively work on the system lens. That's the gender perspective, that is innovation, which we will need. And mm -hmm. very importantly, it's finance. And we need substantial finance to work on a transformation on food systems and we need new models of connecting public and private finance to really leverage the money that we need um, in order to connect um, to, to connect the dots and really transform the food systems. Let me say two things um, to close up with. Um, one is this is an enormously complex endeavor. And the only way to deal with complexity is to embrace it and not run away from it and not seek shelter in the silos in our areas um, of comfort. The solutions are not simple and where people are um, propagating simple solutions, we risk polarization, we risk isolation and we certainly um, cannot afford that. And my last point that is that the all importance of our narratives in changing that. Because all too often, particularly in areas where we are talking about our environment, we are talking about limitations, we are talking mm -hmm. about what we shouldn't do, we are talking about trade-offs and all of that. 
We've spent years, and I would even say we wasted years, thinking in categories such as mitigation, adaptation, resilience, as if those issues were separated. They are not. We need to look at the collective wins. We need to see that a more biodiverse agricultural model is also a more resilient agricultural model. It's a model that is absorbing carbon. It's a model that manages water. It's a model that actually helps us build a more climate resilient and more adaptive system. And just one thing I, I also took from this very rich panel is this notion that it seems that also sustainably minded companies came out better out of the crisis than the ordinary mm -hmm. company. I find that fascinating. I could go on for a long time, but as <laughs> guys, I'm, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity and I hope I didn't go over time. Thank you very much and back to you. Thank you very much, Martin. Danke. You really highlighted a very important point. Let's not, you know, stick to, you know, let's not, you know, obviously have, you know, seek shelter in our silos. I really, really like that point. That's a very important point. Without further ado, I'm going to ask Ayman Shakur, who's the Strategy Development Officer at the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection, Climate Change Lead Council, also at the Center for Sustainable Development Law, and also Regional Facilitator of major groups and stakeholders in Africa, UNEA 5, and also Ambassador for Adaptation Without Borders. Ayman, your thoughts, takeaways, and how you see, I mean, just listening to Martin on this, you know, food systems and the food system summit, how do we tackle some of these challenges of managing transboundary uh, climate risks? Over to you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, apologies for the challenges in connecting earlier. I'm happy we're able to sort them out. Uh, so yes, in terms of how, uh, what are my, my key takeaways from this very fascinating event that we've had today? Uh, I would select, um, I would base myself on three quotes uh, that I heard during the day. Uh, the first of them was uh, from Nigel, um, the uh, Honorable Champion, who at some point referred to uh, the COVID-19 crisis as the canary in the coal mine. And I think uh, it is an important way to look at this issue in terms of the alert that it is bringing to our attention, but we could also perhaps try to uh, frame it in a, in a more positive way, as important as it is to keep in mind the very real negative impact of the crisis. But if we keep with the image of digging, in, not necessarily in a coal mine, of course, but if we keep digging deeper and deeper, I think this is how we really understand how interconnected we all are. Uh, definitely, I'm not going to pretend to be a geologist, I'm definitely not, but as we go closer to the core of our beautiful planet, we realize how much closer we are to each other. And I think the Adaptation with Our Borders initiative is very much uh, dependent on that realization and the realization of the potential that emerges from that understanding. And clearly one of the things that I take away from today's event is how well aligned are the world streams of this beautiful initiative with and the beautiful potential it has with a lot of the issues and solutions that have been uh, identified today. So we talked about risk pathways, of course, looking at it through a specific angle. We also looked, of course, at policy. We looked at planning and implementation. All those work streams remain very relevant in how we project ourselves forward, the what is clear, the how is becoming clearer every day, and the why was once again reminded to us by the excellent intervention at the opening by, by Nigel. Uh, the other two of the interventions I wanted to refer to, I'll start with uh, my dear friend Martin, who cautioned us against isolation. And once again, working together and not looking at adaptation in silos, looking beyond the borders, whether they are at the national level, at the regional level and international level, is paramount to our ability to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement and the broader 2030 agenda. And finally, uh, I guess a bit of a tongue-in-cheek reference uh, following uh, this beautiful intervention from my fellow ambassador just a minute ago, when he concluded by saying, may the force be with us. And I think clearly, uh, you don't have to be following uh, Baby Yoda or this, this uh, kind of uh, very fashionable TV shows these days to understand that this force connects us, 
this force is also built on our ability to share understanding while respecting the very context specific reality that we all have uh, in full deference to the expertise wherever it exists because while there is definitely expertise in the global north there is also expertise in the global south and interfacing those two so that we can learn from each other is paramount to enhancing the understanding connecting it with the kind of decision we need to see following up on the decision with concrete action and then evaluating the impacts of this action when it comes to enhancing our adaptive capacity and the resilience of our societies altogether thank you very much Thank you very much, Ayman. Indeed, may the force be with us, but I think the force is already with us uh, because, as, as Nigel said, from the very outset, the level of interconnectedness for the planet and the actual importance of realizing our very fragility, if COVID-19 has not taught us anything, clearly we've not learned and we need to learn from that. And because climate change, we're going to bring a lot more complex issues Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, whoever is joining us out there, thank you so much for staying the course and just for being part of this really enriched and really just interesting and exciting conversation. For me, it's been such an honor to really be your moderator and host for this session. But I want to say, I mean, I know that all of you are incredibly webinared out and exhausted of just being part of this, you know, we're not sort of seeing our human emotions in person, etc. However, we do know that a lot of the key messages pulled out of all these different discussions are going to be curated together and also uh, presented over to the high level champions for climate action, synthesized. And in the final event, that's going to be happening on the 17th of November from 6.30 through to 8 p.m. GMT. This is going to be presented in what should be the regional on global priorities for the world, so regional to global. We've had such fantastic questions from you and thank you so much for putting in those questions. I'd also like to say that, you know, all the partners who've been involved in putting this together want to want you to stay involved and stay engaged because this is such an important and pivotal question. I'm hoping we have the slide on the screen in terms of where you can sign up for updates with Adaptation Without Borders. Uh, go to their website where you found a wealth of resources and strengthening our systemic resilience, you know, cross-border and cascading climate risk. Or if you like, you can simply just drop Cathy Harris, the Director of Adaptation Without Borders, an email, and she will happily respond or have someone at least respond. This event has been actually recorded, and so the recording will be shared on the SEI website in the next one to two days. We're hoping to really get the turnaround fairly quickly. And we'll send a link, you know, for you to register for any upcoming event, and please use those links and follow us on Twitter. And remember the Twitter handle two Twitter handles, Adaptation Without Borders and Race to Zero. Thank you for being a part of this Race to Zero and to all the amazing speakers. Thank you so very much for all the input you've provided on this really incredible session. Thank you very much and all have a lovely and safe day wherever you are. Thank you very much.